Um, Let's see, just on a, t uh, on a side note, if, if you didn't get connected with the home group but you still want to, uh, let us know and we can get you plugged in because uh, we'd love to, love to offer that and have you connected. We, we've just found during this time that uh, people are wanting to gather in just smaller communities. People are like, uh, I don't know about you, but if, if, whenever I talk to somebody, um, whether it be phone, whether I run into them, whether we visit them, uh, whether it's here, people really want to talk. There's just a lot going on, and you know, it's something that's uh, just healing for us to process through, you know, things that are going on in our world, things that are going on in our own lives. Because what you know, we've been through, uh, like they say, just change is a traumatic thing, like big moves, uh, a death, those kinds of things. And just in our world right now, we've been through a lot. Uh, there's been a lot of death. There's been a lot of transition. There's been, you know, people you know had to move, change jobs, just more than ever. And so I think uh, uh, these home groups will be really precious for all of us. Uh, not only will we be learning something super valuable, but we'll be uh, also just getting to kind of pray with one another and support each other. So anyways, there's my advertisement if you didn't already get plugged in, or if you were thinking, yeah, I signed up, but I don't really want to go. Or maybe you're like, oh, I don't know if I like my home group leader, and you know, but just go anyways, check it out, and okay. So yeah, especially, yeah, I, I heard that, because I think I'm your home group leader. <laughs> <sighs> so anyways, welcome, welcome online for those of you watching online. We're glad to have you. We're, uh, you know, the, it's, it's been fun, you know, now we do both. Hey, there you go. We're up with the times now, right? Uh, we weren't really planning on that. And then the other thing I wanted to mention too is uh, we do now uh, the Bible app. So uh, Uversion Bible app, which is just an app on your phone, um, because we're we're kind of having to do all this touchless stuff. You know, now somebody has to serve you coffee, and uh, you know we we can't really hand you a bulletin. So uh, we're doing our announcements currently on the Bible app. And so uh, if you want to, uh, whether you're online or whether you're uh, here and with us, you can open up your YouVersion Bible app and under the, the little more tag, there's events in your area. And we are now an event in your area. And so you can click on that. You can get all our announcements. You can actually follow along. All the scriptures are in there. Uh, and then it has information at the end. Uh, on what to read this week as we follow along uh, the Revelation series. So this week, actually, uh, we're asking everybody to read Revelation 1 through 3. So three chapters, you know, this week as we go through this week. So, all right, so that's your homework. I thought I'd get it out there before I forgot, because I forgot last night. All right, so um, we have... Uh, um, you know, summer of Revelation coming up, and, you know, some people think we're kind of uh, crazy or bold either way for uh, going after this as a series for our summer. You know, we're only doing it in eight weeks. It's not a lot of time. So we're not gonna hit every point and every detail and all of that. But I imagine uh, that you, you will come to know Jesus more in the next eight weeks as we study Revelation. Um, Revelation, uh, if you don't know, was written by John, and he, uh, uh, they say between about 92 and 96 AD that Revelation was written. Now, this, this was after Peter and Paul were, were killed, uh, crucified. This was after Timothy was murdered, and then things got even worse because the emperor of the, at the time in Rome, D Domitian was his name, uh, he basically said, uh, Everybody has to go to the, the temple and uh, take a, a thing of incense and uh, throw it in the fire at the altar and say that, they, that Caesar is Lord. So basically, he is Lord. He's saying, worship me, worship the Roman government, worship uh, Domitian. And now, he didn't care that they had, any, uh, that they had other gods, because at that time, you know, there were lots of gods that people worshipped, uh, all, the, all the Greek gods that were being worshipped. So, you know, what was one more god? What was, what was the big deal to say, hey, Caesar, Caesar is Lord? But for John, it was a big deal. John wouldn't do that. He would not say Caesar is Lord. He, he, he was okay to honor Caesar, but he would not go to the temple and, and put the incense at the altar and say, Caesar is Lord, right? He said, Jesus is Lord. 
My God is the Lord. Caesar is not the Lord. Well, that kind of got him in a little bit of trouble. <laughs> so basically, he became an enemy of the state, and he's banished to Patmos, which is what they did at that time with prisoners or enemies of the state. They would banish them. If we just banish John to Patmos, we're not going to have to deal with him. He's not going to cause an uproar. We're not going to have any problems. And Patmos is outside of modern-day Turkey, and uh, we actually got to go there. Uh, it's been maybe, I don't know, three or four years now that we got to go on the Footsteps of Paul tour, and that happened to be one of the stops, was getting to go uh, to the island of Turkey and, and going in about 10 miles and going to the place where John received the revelation of Jesus. And I have a picture, actually, of, uh, of this, where this picture right here is the view from from the, the cave where he wrote it. Uh, so it was actually, it's beautiful there. It probably didn't, you know, I, I don't, it obviously didn't have all those homes and such. Um, it was a, an island that was a rock quarry at the time. And then what you see over here on the left, uh, that's the entrance uh, to the cave. And then I have another picture of the inside of the cave, and obviously now they made it into a tourist area, so it didn't quite have all the fancy stuff and look quite like this. Um, you know, it was more just the cave and some, probably some candle and lanterns and that sort of thing. But essentially, uh, now there's a monastery there, there's a church there, you know, and they've made it like a big tourist attraction. But it's, um, it was amazing to me to get to be there and stand there. And, I, and as we're there, I'm like, you know what? Like, I, we are standing on a place, at a place where, like, God, like, totally broke through and spoke to uh, his son to pin this book that we need to call Galatian. And I just remember, you know, being in awe as we stood there. And, you know, there were lots of people, because, of course, we're on a, a tour and, and all that stuff, but I tried to just kind of, you know, pull away and, and sit on a rock and, and just say, you know, Lord, what do you have for me here? Like, what, how would you speak to me here? And I think that's part of what we're saying in this Summer of Revelation series. Like, God, like, how would you speak to us as we study Revelation? You know, don't we all just want to hear more from the Lord? Don't we just all want to be closer to him? Don't we just want it, just a, a pulling back, a glimpse of even more of what he has for us as mankind and, and um, in, this, in this season of revelation? And so anyways, I did uh, hear from the Lord. I was in awe in that moment as I sat on the rock. I just, I really felt the peace and the presence of the Lord and just confirmation, like I'm God, right? I mean, that was, that was a beautiful moment for me, so it was really near and dear to my heart, and so um, I'm excited to be getting to walk through this book with you guys. So some will say that no other book of the Bible actually presents the gospel message as powerfully as this last book does, right? So uh, literally the title of Apocalypse, the revelation of Jesus, Apocalypse, Revelation, you know, basically the same thing. In, in, in ancient times, the word apocalypse wasn't uh, uh, viewed as a bad word. Like now we hear the word apocalyptic, like apocalyptic proportion. Like, you know, earthquakes come and all this stuff happens. It's an apocalyptic proportion. Like, like it it's really has a negative connotation now. Like everything's gonna blow up. The world's coming to an end. And, but back then, that wasn't how they looked at this word at all. The, uh, the apocalypse literally meant the, the unveiling, the, the revealing the revelation, I mean, the, uh, the pulling back of a curtain. And I think, you know, what a great time to be looking at and asking the Lord, would you just pull, pull back the curtain and open our eyes, open our hearts, and open our minds and our ears to how you would like to speak to us through your word in this book. Um, I love the word, the Apostle Paul uses the word in the letter to Romans, uh, claiming the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, because in it is the righteousness of God is revealed. And literally, the right relatedness of God breaks through, and that breaking through there is also uh, the, the same uh, word that's used in Revelation, the uh, breaking through of God. Breaking, the breaking through of the kingdom 
you know, which we've talked about many times. We, we love, in the vineyard, we love to talk about the inbreaking of the kingdom because we believe that Jesus broke in, like when he came in, in the form of a baby, when he was born on this earth, like the kingdom of God was ushered in in that moment, and the kingdom broke in. And then we will see the kingdom break in in its fullness when Jesus returns, okay? So I love that word there. Uh, Daryl Johnson says, this is a down-to-earth manual, the book of Revelation, on how to be a disciple of Jesus, facing the realities of life on the earth, uh, in particular, how to do uh, this the way Jesus did and does. And it really brings us, uh, you know, if you, if you talk about uh, the book of Revelation as a discipleship tool, it really brings us to just the razor point decision, like who will we follow? Who will we serve? Like who are we going to call the Lord of our life? You know, is it gonna be this God? Or is it gonna be serving the world. And so I think the book of Revelation does that like no other book does. Like who will we serve? Um, the, the, I was thinking actually about the, the book of Revelation, well really the entire word of God. Like if, if we wanted to get to know a city, like let's say you, you know, we want to know Canyon City. And uh, you know, we're thinking about moving here or whatever, and so we want to get to know this town, or maybe we've just moved here and we want to get to know this town. Um, like, what would we do? You know, maybe we'd drive around and we'd kind of look around and get to know the area. Maybe we'd go to the top of Skyline and we'd get the, the bigger view. Maybe we'd go, uh, uh, maybe we'd take a helicopter tour. You know, people do things like that. You take a helicopter tour and kind of get the whole lay of the land you know, and get a bigger view of, of the city. But then we'd also maybe like walk the street. Like we'd get down on Main Street and you know, we'd go to the different places. Maybe we'd go to some of the landmarks of the area. Maybe we'd go to the history museum and kind of figure out you know, some of the history of, of our town, right? And then you know, we might talk to some different people. Like maybe we would talk to people that have lived here a long time what do you like about Canyon City? What do you think? What have you seen here in our community? And maybe we'd uh, talk to somebody that hadn't, hasn't been here as long and kind of get their take on what they think of our, our little city here. And so, so the reason I say that is because I, I feel like, you know, studying scripture is a bit like that. And as we embark on this journey of studying Revelation, it's a bit like that, that, that you know, like maybe when we come, we, we come and we read Revelation the first time and, you know, we're not really sure. But we come back to it and we get a different perspective. Or maybe we talk to somebody or maybe we're in a home group together and, you know, maybe we kind of, you know, find a different resource and maybe we uh, read, you know, something about the book. And then we see, we get a different perspective and God continually opens our eyes so that we really get to know his word in a new way. And so I, th I think that's a, a neat comparison uh, as we embark on this journey. Okay, so, so when John wrote the book of Revelation, he uh, literally, he, he was writing uh, to the churches of Asia, um, and that was who he was first addressing. And the greatest danger, obviously, was persecution. Uh, but even more than that, when Jesus was writing to the seven churches, it was complacency within the church. Like, that was a threat. Complacency is a threat to the church. Complacency is a threat to uh, our relationship with Jesus. Complacency prevents us from being passionate about Jesus. And the book of Revelation takes us, uh, like is basically taking us out of that place of, you know, we can't be complacent. We don't wanna just kinda rest. Like there's work to be done. There's more to do, there's more that God is calling us to uh, on our discipleship journey. Uh, Eugene Peterson suggests that in the book of Revelation, we're actually uh, taught nothing new. And not everybody would probably agree with this, but uh, this is Eugene Peterson's version. He says, you know, we're really just taught it in a new way. Like everything that we see in Revelation is in the rest of the Bible. Like all, you know, the, the, dis the discipleship message, the salvation message, everything is really in the word already, but what we see in the book of Revelation 
is a new way to see the same thing, right? And we're taught these truths uh, in a very uh, vivid, um, you know, because Revelation uses lots of imagery. So we're taught it in a very uh, uh, vivid uh, imagery, new kind of way, right? Um, so anyways, as difficult as the symbolism and imagery is, you can know the, the overarching theme of the book, right? The theme is fundamental. The theme is the same. It's not hard to discern. It means Jesus is the conquering king, and he has the victory, and he's won. I mean, that's, that's the theme. Satan is defeated, and Jesus has the victory, right? So as we're reading it, as you're reading some of these crazy things, and you're like, this makes no sense to me, uh, or whatever, you know, you just have that in mind, that Jesus is the theme of this book, right? His victory is the theme. Okay, so we're going to walk a few things. Last night, we actually had a guest here, uh, Bob G., if any of you know him. We had him, and him and I just sat and visited, and I asked him some different questions. Um, and so I'm going to answer some of those same questions uh, as well, although I'm going to answer them as if it's me and, and not, getting hit, uh, not him. Um, but it was just neat to have uh, you know, somebody here that uh, has studied and really focused on uh, Revelation as, as a love and a passion, because there are people that really get into the book of Revelation, right? They're really passionate uh, about this book of Revelation. Um, but anyways, uh, I believe uh, that studying the book of Revelation has helped me in my walk with Jesus, right? Um, as I've studied it through the years, uh, what I find, you know, I came to know Jesus when I read uh, the Bible. I just read it all the way through. And it was about in the book of Acts that I just totally, my heart got wrecked. And, and I just kept going, and I went through the book of Revelation. It made no sense to me the first time, uh, but I remember just still being in awe of God and wanting to know uh, more. And, and so for me in my personal walk, every time I read Revelation, I, I kind of come back to that. Like I am just in awe of this God that we get to serve, and the one that created us. I am in awe of him, and so it makes me come back to him. In Isaiah 46, 9 through 10, you know, it, it says, this is a common verse, probably know, remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning. From ancient times, what is still to come, I say, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. And I think what this, this affirmation is saying is that uh, he, he is God and he's proclaiming it. He's proclaiming it for all of us. Like there is no doubt. He knows the end from the beginning. He is the Alpha and the Omega. And this was prophesied hundreds of years before the book of Revelation was written. And we see that all throughout scripture is that things in the Old Testament speak to, then things in the Testament speak to what we see in the book of Revelation. And so every time I read Revelation, I'm just in awe of how the entire scripture like come together, how we see these things laced all throughout the story. Because you know, it is, at the end of the day, it is one book. The Bible is a book. And a lot of times, you know, we, we, we take chapters uh, and we uh, really get into a chapter, but as a whole, it's a beautiful book, and the book of Revelation is the end of the story, right? Okay, so John himself uses three words to describe the book, uh, uh, the genre of the book of Revelation, right? He calls it a letter, he calls it a prophecy, and he calls it an apocalypse. Okay, it, it is a letter. It happens to be the longest letter in the Bible. And, you know, John was a pastor, and so, of course, he, his heart as a pastor is like, hey, I want you guys to know this God. I want you to know that when persecution happens and when things get tough and when plagues come and when all these things happen, I want you to know as a pastor to press on, to make it through because we win. In the end, Satan is defeated. Satan is totally destroyed and there is victory, so keep pressing on. So this is John's heart as he's pinning this letter. It is a letter and he's gonna win, so he's encouraging his people. It's also a prophecy. Five times John or the angel calls this work a prophecy. And you know, the purpose of prophecy is not just to uh, connote kind of a prediction, but it's a declaration. Have you ever heard the term, thus saith the Lord? 
Yeah, like that's a prophecy. Like this is what the Lord says. He says that Jesus has the victory. He is the conquering king um, and Satan will be defeated. And so it's a declaration and God reveals that to us. He's revealing that declaration to us. And, and basically, um, uh, I, 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 there's some a little show that the kids watch and, and the guy says, I have spoken. Do you, you know what? Oh yeah, Mandalorian. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a silly show. But anyways, that's what he says. I have spoken. P- period. Like end of story. I have spoken. This is what God says. Thus saith the Lord. Same thing. I have spoken. It is done. It is finished. This is happening. Okay? Come, come with us to, to see this is happening. So that's what it means by prophecy. Okay? And then third, of course, uh, it's an apocalypse. The word Uh, Apocalypse means revelation. And uh, really, apocalyptic writing seeks to unveil uh, the unseen reality of the present. And so uh, uh, pulling back a curtain is a good way to look at it. The pulling back, a a revealing of of something. And you know, he wants us to know. He doesn't want to leave us in the dark about this. Like God, uh, you know, this book wasn't written so we could be confused. This book was written so that we could know and we could pull back the curtain and see something here, okay? All right, so five points of study in Revelation. I actually, I have a slide for this, um, that our heart in studying this together is that we would desire to worship God in greater measure, that we would have more hope for today knowing the end of the story, that we would feel compelled to share the story of Jesus with others, and uh, that we would see how much Jesus loves his church, and that we would know justice is served and evil is judged. So as we walk through uh, uh, the book of Revelation together, these are kind of the things, the the five points that we uh, felt were really important that we come away with as we walk this journey together. And some would say, you know, would have some other other points. There's lots of ways we can study it, but you know, because we're just doing it in eight weeks, these are the things that we felt were really important that we walk away with. And you know, um, right now, I think it's really important that people know that justice is served and that evil is eradicated. You know, in our world today, you know, there will not be justice. Man, mankind, we, you know, people are crying out for justice. There will not be justice like people want until Christ returns. And so I think this will be really helpful uh, even as we discern the times that we're walking in uh, to know that, that God is the one that uh, ultimately is a just God and has righteous judgment, okay? All right, so, uh, another question I, I had asked Bob last night uh, that I thought would be helpful for us today is um, why, uh, why do you think there's a negative attitude uh, in both churches and seminaries like, from teaching the book of Revelation? Because you know, you can actually go to a seminary and not really learn about uh, Revelation, and you can go to a church and have them never teach on the book of Revelation. I don't know if you know this, but it's true. Uh, A a lot of places might shy away from Revelation because uh, of a number of reasons. And, uh, you know, one, it's it's a little more challenging, right? I mean, how many of you read the book of Revelation and been like, I have no clue what they just said, (laughs) right? Uh, It makes no sense. So, uh, and and the other would be that there's uh, numerous, um, you know, eschatologists, which means the study of end times, eschatologists like spend their lives like studying and researching this stuff and saying, well, is Jesus gonna come here? Is he gonna come here? Is it pre, is it post, is it mid? When's the millennium? Like they spend their lives going after this and researching it and, and like they have studied and studied and yet we still have these different theories about like when Jesus will come and exactly what it's looked like and they they're all have valid reasons and so that can be a little like what do you do with that? And so our heart as we go through this study is not to, not to bring any kind of uh, disagreement or division but we believe there's so in this book that we can agree on Right, that the point of this book is not like exactly when he's coming. You know, that the point of this book is that he is coming <laughs> and that we can have hope in that. So I think it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful book, but a, a lot of churches will shy away from teaching it because of that. Another reason that people will shy away is because, you know, the enemy doesn't want us to know. 
The enemy absolutely does not want us to know uh, that, that Jesus wins and he's gonna be defeated. So if he can keep us from that, there's a great scripture in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, and it says, the God of this age, which would be Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel or the glory of Christ who is the image of God. So, you know, he is our adversary and his time is short and he doesn't have the victory. So any way he can confuse us or prevent us from getting into the book of Revelation and, and knowing where we stand and having the hope that is so rooted in the victory that we have in Christ, he will do it because he wants to prevent us from doing that, right? Uh, he, he's not a good guy. Um, and then also, uh, yeah, churches don't teach it or seminaries because they just, they just say it's too difficult to understand, so ne- let's not jump into it. Uh, but we believe there's a lot that we can understand. So even if you're new to the book of Revelation, we just believe there's so much that you're gonna get out of this and uh, that you'll understand and that you will love Jesus just that much more. All right, so uh, Martin Luther actually once quoted this. You guys know, all know who Martin Luther uh, is. Not Martin Luther King, Martin Luther Um, and, And he actually quoted this about the book of Revelation. He says, my spirit cannot adapt itself to the book and a sufficient reason why I do not esteem it highly is that Christ is neither taught nor recognized in it. And so we think about that. I mean, I don't know about you, but I can actually relate to that. He most likely made this statement, you know, early in his walk earlier in his uh, papacy or whatever, and uh, uh, he probably, you know, because have, haven't you, I, I have read the book of Revelation early on, right, and been like, I don't know where this talks about Christ. I don't know what this is talking about. And can you just totally relate to me on that? Like, you, you're just like, oh my gosh, what is he saying? It makes no sense, and I really am not sure what it says about Jesus. What does this have to do with anything? And so, so I can see how uh, someone that we admire as, a, uh, as one of our forefathers could make a statement like this. But that is not the truth at all, right? As you, as you start to learn and read the book of Revelation and kind of go back to it and continue to study it through the years, you will find it is all about Jesus. It completely points to Jesus all throughout, right? Uh, just from the very beginning, right? Chapter 1 1, the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show the servants what mu- must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel and servant, John. Um, and I want to read you just a few more, just to point, but there's so many more than this. Uh, the entire theme of Revelation is declared in chapter 1, verse 7. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him, and so shall it be. And in verse 18, Christ identifies himself. He says, I am the living one, I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys to de- uh, of death and Hades, right? So, so, so much. Cha- the theme of chapter five, that Jesus and his saints will again reign over the world. Six through nine, that Jesus is the wrathful one. 11 and 12, Jesus is the true Messiah. Chapter 20, Jesus is the king of kings. Chapter 21, Jesus is the eternal one. Chapter 22, Jesus is the returning one. So I would just encourage you that as we walk this journey through the book of Revelation that you would remember that it's all about Jesus. And so even when you may not understand something or it doesn't make total sense, it's really pointing all towards Jesus and his absolute and total victory over Satan. And God wants us to know this because it's an important message. It's absolutely important. Um, The other thing that Revelation does, I believe, is uh, it provides much hope for us. You know, we just got done with a series called Jesus is Our Living Hope. And um, when we know the rest of the story, that we can have hope that other people don't have. When we know um, uh, just the, the deep-seated truths that are in relation, that we can truly have a bigger picture of God's story for all of us, 
God's story of redemption, God's story of his son's return, God's story of the victory that we get uh, in Jesus Christ. And so it, it's really a book of victory to encourage uh, Christians as we try and cope and figure this life out here on earth, right? All right, so I, I um, as we study the book of Revelation, as uh, you know, there's so many ways to study the book of Revelation. And, uh, you know, so we were just talking last night, and it's like, you know, if, if you were to study it, um, like what would be uh, one thing that you might say if you really wanted to, you know, figure Revelation out? And one of the things that Bob brought up last night, he says, you know what, every time you read Revelation, you got the Holy Spirit to come and help you. Like, would you invite the Holy Spirit to come and help you understand? Because the Holy Spirit lives in you. Holy Spirit speaks to you. Holy Spirit opens up things to you um, and lives within you. Like, he's our helper, right? That's one of the descriptions of the Holy Spirit. And so we say, like, Holy Spirit, would you help us? <laughs> like, okay, I'm reading this. And ever do that thing where you read something and, like, you didn't get any of it? and you have to go back and you, you do it again, and then you're like, oh, I, my, my mind went that way. Okay, refocus. And then, but then you come to a place where you're like, okay, God, would you help me? You know, Holy Spirit, would you come and help me to understand this? Would you help me even focus on what I'm reading? And then all of a sudden, the words like kind of come alive to you, and you're like, ah, oh, there you go. I mean, that's what, that's what Holy Spirit does. That's who he is. So in, in 1 John 2, 27, it says, you have received the Holy Spirit. He lives within you. So you don't need anyone to teach you what is true, for the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know. And what he teaches is true. So we can rely, as we walk this journey together, we can rely on the Holy Spirit to help us on this journey, okay? So just invite him. All right, a few more things. Uh, 40 times uh, in Revelation, John says, I saw. 32 times he says, I heard. 19 times in the book he says, look. Right? The book of Revelation is very sensory oriented. Like, will you, will you look for how God is speaking to you right now? Would you listen to what he might want to say to you right now? So look. See what he's trying to do with this, right? Look, he's coming with the clouds. Look. I'm alive forevermore. I have the keys to death in Haiti. Look, a throne and one sitting on it. Look, the lion has overcome. Look, a white horse, and he who sets upon it is called faithful and true. Look, the tabernacle of God is among people, and he will dwell with them. So, so many times he gives us descriptions that are filled with kind of our, our senses. And uh, um, so I would just encourage you uh, even to invite the Holy Spirit to help you with that, to be able to look and see and hear what he would have for you on this journey. Uh, one, uh, one other thing too, as we walk through the book of Revelation, um, things don't necessarily progress in chronological order, but they progress as John sees them because he's having this experience. I mean, you know sometimes you have a dream and it doesn't all line up. <laughs> You're like, uh, wait a minute, where was that? Where did that fit into the timeline? Well, that's kind of what happens in Revelation. It's not necessarily, it's what is seen. So remember that as you're walking through this. What is he seeing? What does he hear next? Not necessarily in chronological order. So, um, how much time? I got just a few minutes left. Book of Revelation is so, so good. Um, all right, three overall things. We'll do this, and, and, then, and then we'll kind of wrap it up. So three great unseen realities with the book of Revelation. Uh, the first is that uh, Jesus is coming. So however, uh, these are like three things to remember as we study the book of Revelation. Uh, Jesus is coming, right? It says this numerous times, both at the beginning and the end. Everything that we see here, it can be bracketed by the fact that the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world is coming. Okay, simple, right? The second unseen reality is the time is near. 
the time is near in 1 3 verse 1 3 it says blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy blessed are those who hear it and take heart what is written in it because the time is near and then at the very end of revelation it says then he told me do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this scroll because the time is near the time is near. John also used these uh, same uh, words in the proclamation of Mark 1.15. He says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. That's because the king is near. Jesus is near, right? And then the third unseen reality as we walk this journey together is the I am statements in this book, right? In the very beginning, he says, I alpha the omega, the beginning and the end of all things you know, period, end of statement. At the very end of the book, he says, I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. So this whole book is bracketed by these three things, right? He's coming, the time is near, and I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end of all things. Um, so those are the three things I want you to remember as we go through this book. Okay, so last thing I wanna talk about is um, just, um, I, guess, I guess what I want to bring up, you know, as you're, as you're walking through this study with us, as you're in home groups, whatever it is, uh, is, you know, just kind of the heart of this as we study this book is to have grace for one another. Because some of you in here, maybe you've studied Revelation a lot. Maybe you, you know, you have been one of those people that's just gotten into it, it's taken hold of you, you love it, and you know a lot about it. And you can't wait to get in your home group and tell other people about it. Um, and, and so if you are not that person, see, we're going to have to have grace for the person that knows a lot. <laughs> Because that's going to be like, oh, how can they know all this? And where do they get all this? And, you, you know, like, I want to be there. Or maybe that's annoying. I don't know. Either way, you know, you're know-it-all people, and they know it all, and they want to make sure that everybody knows it all. Um, but we also have to have grace ones that are on the other end of the spectrum, because we're going to have people all, all across the board. So we have to have much grace for the ones that really don't know anything, that have maybe just read it once because or read parts of it, or never read it. We probably have people that have literally never read the book of Revelation, and so, so we've gotta have grace for those people as well. Because we're, it's like, just like our discipleship journey, when we're on a discipleship journey with Christ, we're all at different places. You know, some of us have walked with Jesus for years, some are brand new to the faith, and you know what, that's okay. So we have grace for one another, as we walk this journey of revelation, okay? So I'm gonna call up David and Robert again, and um, I just, I have a prayer that I actually, uh, I got from a man named Daryl Johnson, and um, um, I wanted to read this prayer because I thought it was beautiful, and then, uh, and then we'll just pray and invite the Holy Spirit to help us as we walk this journey together, okay? Uh, so this is the Daryl Johnson. He says, living Lord, as we now dare to make our way through revelation, will you please help us? Help us understand why you have spoken to us in this unique and strange way. Help us understand what, is, what it is you are wanting us to know and do. Help us stay true to your intent on giving us this book. And most of all, please help us meet you in it. You're the ultimate subject of this book. I love that. God, would you help us to meet you in this book? You're the ultimate subject of the book. Would you help us? And so God, we pray right now that your Holy Spirit would come and that you would truly help us. Whether we are brand new or whether we are seasoned people in this book, that we would be open to what you have to teach us that your Holy Spirit would come, that we would enter into this journey with grace and humility and total reliance on you. Lord, your word wasn't just given to us so that we would know your word. Your word was given to us so that we 
could also have relationship with you, that most of all you desire uh, relationship, personal relationship with us. And we don't miss that, God. We may not understand everything, and that's okay. But we want relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. I just got a picture of, of uh, a child coming uh, to me and wanting to understand something. You know when your kids are little and they're like, well, why this? Well, why is there air? Well, why is the water like this? Why does the, why is there fire? You know, you know? I mean, if you have little kids right now, you're like, yeah, I am so done with answering all their questions, right? The whys, the whys, the whys, they wanna know why. But really, so much more than the whys is they just wanna be with you. They want comfort of knowing that you're with them. And because, you know what, when they ask us, we don't always have all the answers. Like, oh, yeah, like I learned that in science class, uh, but I don't really remember. But here, you know, let's journey that together. Let's, figure, let's even go look. I'll look, we'll find out. You know what I mean? And so we just come with that same, that same place of, Lord, we, we want to know all the whys. So let's journey that together. Okay? All right, so why don't you stand and... We'll finish out with some